Part two, energy. This is obviously an extraordinarily broad topic, and I'm going to take a step back and do what I can to condense it, condense it into something understandable. The first thing I'm gonna write down here is a couple of observations. It's not observations that I have, it's observations that we have collectively with the scientific method about how energy works. And I've mentioned this before, but there's a sort of anti-symmetrical relationship between momentum and position in energy. So I'll tell you what they are first. And that is that P1, imagine a single particle, P1 dot, which is the negative partial derivative of epsilon, the system energy function with respect to position. And then x1 dot is the partial derivative of the energy function with respect to momentum. So like I said, they have this sort of anti-symmetrical property. Now, I'm not going to derive these. In fact, I will never derive these. These are observations that we can make about, imagine, so what this says, let me, let me write it this way. What this says is that epsilon is composed of what we call kinetic energy and potential energy. And these partial derivatives suggest that the force is associated with the potential. So I'm gonna just loosely write an association here that the potential energy is associated with P1 dot, which is the force, and we'll get to that. And the kinetic energy is associated with x1 dot, which is the speed. So analogously, we could say, imagine you have a mass spring system. Okay, this is not uh, groundbreaking stuff. This is something you hear about often in, in first year physics courses. Imagine this is x equals zero. And there's a spring here, a restorative force. And you pull this mass out to here and you let it go. Well, what you're going to notice is that at this point, at this point, it has maximum, maximum potential energy. And here it has max at x equals zero. When it crosses that, it has maximum kinetic energy. It's going its fastest. And then back here, it has maximum potential energy again. It, it oscillates between these two. Okay. There's a oscillation. So what I'm trying to say is that these relationships hold true and we can observe them. Imagine you had um, a frictionless valley that you set a ball rolling down. Well, at the bottom, you're gonna have maximum kinetic energy. At the top, you're gonna have maximum potential energy. My point is, is that these relationships hold true. And the interesting thing is that in these two examples, in one and two here, the potential energy function is not the same and in fact, for different physical systems, you will have different potential energies. However, for Newtonian systems, when we define, let me define something here. When we define momentum P, or I'll, let's call it P1 in this case for a particle to be M1 V1, we're actually saying something about the kinetic energy and let me show you why. So really, if we rearrange a little bit, we get V1 equals P1 over M1. Well, V1 is just dx1 by dt, which can also be written as x1 dot. So we have a relationship between energy and x1 dot and momentum. Let's plug it in. x1 dot, I'm telling you, is equal to P1 over M1. And that is equal to the partial derivative of epsilon with respect to momentum. So if we integrate this, this is a little quick lesson in integration. If I bring the dp up and let's change our differential, partial differentials to total differentials, dp1, okay? You get one over m and leave a little space, p1, dp1, and then d epsilon. Now, if we change this partial differentials to total differentials, really all I'm telling you is about the kinetic energy, the kinetic energy okay um, so we can integrate these we can integrate these quantities and what you will see and I'll just call it uh, let's call it EK EK is equal to if you integrate this you get 
1 over 2m p1 squared plus a constant of integration. Now, this is, if you rearrange a little bit, and I'm going to ignore the constant of integration for now. Let's just forget about it. It's just a constant in physical systems. If there's an extra constant in your total energy function, you're not going to, quote, notice it. Um, let's plug in our definition for P1. We defined P1 to be this, remember. You get M1V1, all squared. Well, sure enough, if you have m1 squared v1 squared over 2, and sorry, sorry guys, this is an m1 here. These are all m1s. Divide by m1, the half is still there, you get half mv squared. This is the classic answer that we expect for kinetic energy. Well, what can we say about the potential energy? We can't say anything about the potential energy. So I'm going to say EP. This is a big question mark. Okay, so you can't say anything about it, and more to the point, it's defined differently for different physical systems. So we've we've nailed down what EK is. Well, what about potential energy? And what we're going to do in the next video is we're going to talk about a principle of least action. And Feynman did a lecture on this, and there's been a lot written about in physics of regarding the principle of least action. Of course, it broadly applies to classical mechanics, quantum mechanics. It's an incredible theory. It's an incredible postulate. The principle of least action tells us something about a potential, the potential energy of a system. And I'm going to write it here briefly. We're going to dive into it more next time. But I'm going to say the principle of least action, the principle of least action, we can deduce something about sort of a relationship when we take this as a postulate and this is a let's call it a postulate and i'm going to say that s capital i didn't write that very neatly postulate i'm going to say that capital s is the integration from t1 to t2 two different places in time if you will times the as i've written it here potential energy minus oh sorry i did this backwards it's the kinetic energy minus the potential energy okay and times dt now what i've already told you we've already defined what potential energy is and i've said we don't know what ep is so we're going to dig into this next time and the the postulate here is that this quantity s s is minimized this is a very once again a grandiose comment about nature and what the comment is is that nature exists in such a way the laws of nature follow this principle of least action such that capital s here is a minimized quantity all right um that's it that's it for this one and uh please like and subscribe and I will see you next time.